Hello, everybody. It is hello, good hello. to see all of you. Welcome back to Rite of Passage alumni. Welcome to new people. Um, let's have some fun. And if everyone could just go in the chat and write about where you're calling from right now. Nice. I love doing this. Houston, London, Jersey, New York, Detroit, Glasgow, Germany, Belgium, Ireland, Canada, India, Uganda, woo! Uh, Nigeria, Australia. Unbelievable. I absolutely love it. So I am here with two people who I'll introduce more formally. Um, Ellen will be co-facilitating this workshop with me. Basically, Ellen is my writing coach, and she's the only reason that I am able to publish sentences that make sense. So Ellen, you're calling from Austin. Do you want to say hi? That's right. Hi, I'm calling from Austin, Texas, and uh, probably the place with the most beautiful weather out of everyone. Yeah, David, very generous. Your sentences make sense without my help. <laughs> Um, and then also Will Manon. So I run an online writing course called Rite of Passage and Will is our director of student experience. Will, why don't you say hi real quick? Yeah, thanks David. Hey everybody, I'm Will calling in from Los Angeles. Excited for today. And if you're gonna be a student in Rite of Passage, I will meet you soon. Looking forward to it. Thanks David. Yeah, so Will uh, doesn't ever sleep at night. He just obsesses over the student experience. That's, uh, that's his whole job, making sure our students are happy. Um, and why don't we begin? So I have one request from all of you. Turn on your video. It's so fun when we can all see each other. Keep, keep if you haven't, right in the chat from where you're from. And I want this chat to be super active. So Will is going to be basically responding to people. He'll be adding interesting ideas in the chat as we go on. If you have any questions, let me know. And Will and I have done this so many times that Will knows exactly how to kind of interrupt me. If there's anything that's confusing, ask a question, anything that's insightful, drop a quote, share an article, do whatever. Anyway, it's great to see all of you. Thank you for being here. I'm going to get into it right now. Okay. So this is the pop writing workshop and it is ellen and i've been working on this for a while and honestly she gets the credit for developing this acronym i really like it and i'm excited to share this with you so a little bit about myself i teach rite of passage and it's a five-week program all about online writing it's designed for really serious writers who want to seriously level up. And basically what I did was I compressed five years of what I've learned about learning to write and to connect with people online and how to just live on the internet. And I shared this all in a five-week course. And the next one starts on Wednesday. So what is that? One week from today. So February 19th, I would love for you to join it's also just an amazing community. And I just launched the Rite of Passage podcast this week. So if you want to just hear me talk about writing for however long, it, it's actually going to be a good way to put yourself to sleep. Uh, but I made them very bingeable sort of Netflix style. And Ellen, I'll let you introduce yourself. Basically, Ellen is my writing course. We met through a student in Rite of Passage, and she's been super helpful for my writing. So Ellen. Hey, yeah, um, I have been a professional uh, B2B and B2C writer, journalist, the whole thing, I've done a lot of writing and recently um, sort of clients pushed me to start the coaching thing. I was like, I don't know if I can teach this, but as it turned out, I can teach it and it's incredibly fun, incredibly rewarding. I love working with uh, so many, so many talented people. It's been totally unreal and uh, David is definitely one of the most gifted writers I have ever coached. I've learned so, so much from him and it's just been, it's just been unreal and fabulous. So thank you so much for, for coming to this workshop. I hope you guys learn a lot from this. Um, it's been something that we've, we've learned from by developing it. 
Absolutely. So Ellen and I, basically, we just talk about stuff and then writing comes out on the other side. Um, we wrote my audience first products article that I published recently. And without Ellen, I would have been able to publish that. Now we're working on an essay called One Big Idea. And I basically take my very hardest essays and I say, Ellen, <laughs> you're responsible for helping me write this. And she goes, no. <laughs> and then we develop things like pop writing. So actually, Ellen's going to lead, lead this. I'll sort of work with her. Um, but Ellen is really the master of these ideas. And so Ellen, why don't you start talking about how we were taught to write? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I once had an unbelievably awesome professor in school who got up in front of like 300 people and said, academic writing is bad writing. It doesn't make sense. It's deliberately obscure. It's really confusing. And I admire that so much because it's just the truth. And it's the truth about business writing too. Generally, you've been taught business writing, get your machine gun out and just, you know, fire statistics at everybody at every turn that you possibly can. Um, you've been taught that you should take, you know, the most smart sounding academic tone that you possibly can when you're doing business writing and be very buttoned up and, you know, don't forget a heaping helping of really hollow buzzwords and jargon, right? So I think all of us intuitively know that the truth is that that's not good writing. Um, so Dave and I were talking about this. It's like, well, what actually makes a piece of writing and especially a piece of business writing, um, what actually makes it good, right? Not this stuff. What makes it good is when, um, when it's memorable. So these, these, kind of, these kind of buzzwords and all this sort of academic style and all the jargon, that's, that's the kind of stuff that just goes in one ear and out the other, right? Like you'll forget it as soon as you read it sooner. So the key to making your writing worth your time and worth your reader's time is making it memorable, okay? So uh, when your writing's memorable, like it's the kind of thing that people remember, people come back. I mean, some of the most beautiful, wonderful compliments I've ever gotten on a piece of writing uh, happen six months later when someone emails me like, hey, Ellen, you know, I read this and at the time I just kind of read it, but then I keep thinking about it and it just keeps kind of coming up and it just keeps being relevant. And I mean, that's, that's an unbelievable result. It's wonderful to hear that. And that's what you want. Okay, that's what you want. So David and I have both had that experience and we're like, okay, how did we produce those excellent pieces of writing that people want to remember and share and come back to and in the end, act on, right? If people remember your ideas throughout their lives again and again, they'll actually act on those. So we talked about it a lot. We were like, okay, well, what's the most memorable thing? like in the world, right? And we pretty much came to the conclusion that uh, a hook in a pop song is like the most memorable thing in the world to the point where it's like obnoxious, right? <laughs> but, um, but this is not about making writing that's like, um, like a you know, mass produced, mass appeal, lowest common denominator kind of like jingle. Um, but it is about uh, producing something that's, that's resonant because everyone, all of us who listen to music we come back to the music we love because it's in, our, it's in our mind. We remember it. We remember that hook. We remember that phrase. And when we revisit that music, we find the full depth and resonance of that music. And that's the experience you want people to have when they revisit your writing. Maybe they remember just the title. Maybe they remember, oh, audience first products. What was that? Then they come back and they see the full richness and depth of your content. So that's what this framework is about. Don't get misled by the idea of pop. Um, pop is just sort of a way to, a way to remember this. Um, so yeah, yeah, I just want to sort of, uh, I just want to sort of, thank you, Ellen. That was awesome. I just sort of want to jump in here and talk about recall. Um, Ellen said something that was, was I think really interesting and I just want to double down on this. So the first article I ever wrote that actually went somewhere was this article called Naked Brands. Full transparency, my mom came up with the name Naked Brands while she was editing my piece, because <laughs> who else is supposed to edit your writing when you have like three readers? And basically, I published it July of 2017, and it took 10 months for people to tell me about it. Actually, it was in Austin. I was walking to a conference, and a friend brought up the Naked Brands idea. And 
I had realized in that moment that the very fact that Naked Brands was memorable was what made it a successful piece of writing. It wasn't just that it was informative or that it sounded smart, like none of that stuff. Like, honestly, the way I teach writing, I don't care about how smart you sound. I don't care about how academic you are. That's not what this is about. This is about making your writing memorable, having it actually resonate with the person that you're talking to. Because what writing is, is it's communication, right? It's like actually this miracle of human achievement where you have person with an idea actually put something on a paper and then have send it to another person, a receiver all the way on the other side of the planet. And so for Ellen and I, making your writing pop is the simplicity to make something catchy, memorable, and fun to read. And now we're going to dive into what it means to make your writing pop, meaning making something personal, observational, and playful. What? <laughs> okay, so so here's here's the uh, here's the Venn diagram. Basically, the three components of pop are personal, observational, and playful. Um, and can we get the text on the? Yeah, um, and the other text maybe also. Perfect. So so when something's personal, when you make something personal, um, that's you are calling to mind an experience that is relatable for people that they've seen with their own eyes, like for example, you know, airport security, <laughs> right? Something like that. Or you're telling a personal story about yourself and your experience that is something that you saw with your own eyes or something that your readers will have seen with their own eyes. So what that does is that builds that instant human connection. Okay. So observational is this idea of revealing insight. So when we were developing this framework, I was like, you know what, like what I'm, what I really do is I kind of break down what are people's strengths, right? And I was looking at, I was looking at David's writing. I was like, you know what, David, like what you're really, really strong in is this observational thing. David has this knack for looking around at the world and going, huh, you know, I'm, I'm just seeing that from this, from this slightly diagonal perspective, right? When other people zig, David zags, right? So he's able to make these observations about the world and then articulate them. And once you've read that, you're like, huh, you know, I never saw that before, but now I'm seeing it. So that's a really, really powerful driver of making your writing memorable in addition to making that instant human connection that makes people feel like, okay, I'm getting to know this person. I'm remembering things about this person. And then the playfulness, okay. Um, the fact is that if you can make an amazing joke at a party, um, you've won favor with everyone at that party, right? If you can tell like a really engaging story or dramatic story or crazy story, you have won either the, uh, either the eyeballs or the respect or you know maybe infamy, right? But either way, you're gonna be memorable. If you can bring out the kid in your reader, if you can make what you're doing really fun for people. So basically what we figured out is that when you have all three of these components, if you can master all three of these things, if you have full command of making your writing personal and observational and playful, I promise you, people will not forget what you wrote down. You might have, you might have a way to go in terms of your architecture or structuring a whole book or something like that, but you will be memorable. People won't forget what you wrote if you're good at this. So the thing is when you have all three of them, uh, you've got memorable writing. When you have just two of them, you have passable writing. So we'll get into that a little bit. Um, but essentially those overlaps of the three bubbles there, entertaining, um, but not informative, right? So if something's personal and playful, that's kind of like, you know, maybe just a memoir or personal story, right? It's not necessarily informative, but, but it might be entertaining. And if something makes insightful observations and talks about personal, you know, personal experiences that are relevant, uh, but lacks that touch of playfulness, of lightheartedness, of bringing out the kid in your reader, then it'll be informative. You'll get your point across, but you won't be memorable because people won't really have fun 
reading what you're doing. So they won't be quite as engaged. And then finally, if you have playful and observational, but you don't make it personally relevant for people in some sense of, oh, they can, they can understand this in their lives, then you're going to be kind of like a space cadet, right? You're really, you're going to be kind of, uh, you know, a little bit, a little bit too abstract. People aren't going, they might be a little bit intrigued, but they're not going to be able to immediately place your ideas in the world that they're living in. So that's kind of really, really high level. And we're going to drill down into kind of the details of each of these components. Um, but that's sort of the high level framework. Yeah, so personal. So personal, the bottom line is you've seen it with your own eyes or your readers have seen it with theirs. The way to bring in something personal, the shortcut, is to think about your five senses. Okay, I saw. I heard, I felt, right? Immediately you are bringing someone in, oh, they're revealing something, right? Or you can talk about something that is a shared experience. Like those of us who, uh, who, who have done Rite of Passage, for example, like remembering Rite of Passage where David talks about serendipity and you know, the value of serendipity, instantly there's a connection, right? So once you have that glue that starts to sort of adhere to your reader's personal experience, that's the beginning of making something memorable. That's the importance of, of the personal thing. And um, so the observational thing, I really, really want David to talk about this because this is, this is uh, oh yeah, this example, right? So the ultimate personal writing is a text message from me to you. Hey, we were gonna meet at Bob's Burgers, but there's a line around the block. So let's go to Krusty Krab instead, right? That is the ultimate personal thing. Who cares about that? Just you and me, nobody else, <laughs> right? Because it's completely a, just a personal, personal thing. So observation I want David to talk about because it's really a superpower. Um, he's, he's I'm really just going to stick on personal a little bit. This is something that I've struggled with a bit. And so this is the framework that Ellen and I use whenever we're working together. The way to think about this is you could almost think of it like uh, what's on your plate where it's like you got your meats, you got your vegetables and you got your grains and you want a diversified plate that works in equal balance. And so if you're going through a buffet and somebody else looks at your plate, it, you can just see, well, there's not enough vegetables there. Throw in some vegetables. Likewise, you can read and you can tell somebody, you know what? That isn't personal enough. You're going to need to add some personal elements to make the writing stand out. And I think that personal is hard for people who are very exterior focused, like a lot of people, maybe like you and like me, who are really focused on ideas and really focused on observing. I think sometimes actually observing and personal are at odds at each, with each other a bit. And I don't really like to write about myself that much. I'd much rather like what goes through my head is just ideas. And so what this does is it gives you different entry points that you can use to actually dive into the personal. So once again, I saw, I felt, I heard, you've seen, you felt, and you've been there. And what you're doing here, I would also think of like, how do you speak to the heart? How do you speak to somebody's emotions? How do you speak to the times in your life where you may have felt good or bad or like these shared experiences that we have? That is what you wanna focus on with personal writing. And like Ellen said, if you want your writing to be more personal, think of like a memoir or something like that and pay attention to how they talk about themselves. Because I think that very often the, the, the way that people go wrong when they do personal writing is that they don't make it observational. And so that's what I want to talk about right now. Um, and I want to just sort of share my philosophy of how I observe things. So I'll talk about the slides a little, and then I'm just going to riff and, and, and just talk from the cuff. So with the observational, this is things that you've noticed that other people haven't. So looking for different patterns, different insights. So you could say, I might have, I've noticed this pattern. And you could say, look at this trend. You could say the best kept secret is, you could say, if you turn your head and think of both these objectively what we're trying to say, but also metaphorically, right? So if you turn your head kind of implies that everyone is looking at the same place. And what you're trying to do is get somebody to look elsewhere, right? Like we're, we're, we're very imitative creatures and we all tend to look in the same places. And so being observational means to just look at different things. You know, it's funny because 
what you want is you want to get, I don't know if any of you have, have spent some time drawing, but when you draw, what you realize is that you never actually see the world. Whether it's the way that the shadows shine through a window, hit off of a bowl and actually land on the table, or the way that I was just looking, I was just having a, I was just having a banana before this. And so I was eating this banana, and then there were two other bananas on the table. And I'm always just like, observe more, observe more, observe more. I probably tell myself that 50 times a day. And I was just like, practicing describing the way that the brown freckles kind of went along the banana, right? And so what if you struggle to observe things, what I would do is maybe just try drawing something. And what you'll realize is you're just like training your brain to realize that there's so much more resolution in the world. Um, and you could also say, you don't know this, but, or you haven't seen that. And an example here would be like Darwin, right? I've noticed that there are 15 different species of finches in the Galapagos Islands alone. Well, obviously that's just pure observation. It's not that interesting. And so that shows both what observation looks like, but also what writing looks like that only has observation. All right, now I'm just going to riff. So basically, um, there's, I don't know if any of you know uh, David McCullough, but he's this, this biographer of, Ameri of, of American history. And when he, he writes, he has this thing above his desk, and it's called Look at Your Fish. What does that mean, David? Basically, there was this 19th century teacher at Harvard. It was like a writing teacher or something, okay? And what he did was on the first day of class, he said, okay, I'm gonna open up this tin jar and I'm gonna take out this fish, right? Like imagine Nemo, everyone loves Nemo, right? So it's you got your orange and white fish. What is it called? Like, it's not a puffer fish. Someone write in the chat, tell me. Um, maybe it's a Nemo fish and clown fish, thank you. Uh, you deserve a golden prize. So a clown fish, right? And so the first day they put the clown fish on the, say the wooden table, whatever. And the teacher leaves the room and goes, okay, you have 30 minutes to write about the, about the fish. So teacher leaves, comes back and goes, okay, students, what did you see? And the students are like, professor, all you did was put a fish on the table. So the professor's like, no, that's not true at all. You have to actually look at the fish. And so they do this day after day after day. And the teacher's like, write more, write more. So on the last day, they have to write 10 pages about the fish, okay? So same thing, open up the jar, put it on the table. And all of a sudden, the students are talking about the way that the eyes are popping out of the head, the way that the fins rest on the table, the way the fluorescent light in the classroom is hitting the orange, white, and the little black thing that sort of goes in between on the clownfish. And they can write a 10-page essay in that time. So what is the point here? The point is that whether it's the freckles on a banana or a fish on a table, there is so much more in the world than we care to see. And the problem, the problem is, and all of you do this, all of you are guilty, each and every one of you. The problem is when you get into a routine, you stop looking at the world. And so what David McAuliffe does is he says, look at your fish. There is so much more even in front of you right now. I'm looking at the little speakers on the side and all the little dots that look like grains of sand on the right side of my computer. There's so much more in the world. And what observation is, is always approaching every experience as if it's your first and your last time experiencing that thing. Why? If it's your first time, you're looking, right? You're taking nothing for granted. You're saying, ooh, never seen that, ooh, never seen that, right? You're, you're, you're just looking everywhere. Like I'm seeing the way that my light right here is shining across my other light. There's a beautiful little reflection. So that's the first time, but then also the last time, so that each moment is scarce, so that you have to pay attention to the moment at hand as the seconds click along the clock. That way you're forced to be engaged in the present moment. So I always remember, look at your fish. There is so much more in the world for you to observe, and there are literally ideas everywhere, I'm telling you.
Okay, let's go into Playful. Fabulous, and we got some feedback that, uh, that my voice was a little quiet. Is this better for people? Um, maybe write in the chat yeah, if, if- Even if a little louder, Ellen, yeah, would be great. Even a little louder? Okay, yeah. awesome. How about this? Ding! Is that, is that is diaphragm. Good, is this a Woo! good volume? All Ellen, right. let's hear you sing. So, <laughs> So, um, so, so playful, right? Like this is, this is really, really important and really uh, is, is something that I'm going to talk about a lot more in the future of, of life in general, but the playfulness component is what uh, separates the, the women from the girls and the men from the boys and the whole thing. Okay. Like if you can make reading fun for people, okay. A lot of people already read for pleasure, but they almost feel like they almost feel like having fun while reading is like a guilty pleasure when it comes to business writing, right? It's like, oh, well, oh, well, that was fun to read, but you know, no, no. You should be able to make reading and learning and your ideas fun, and you should be able to get other people just as excited about your ideas as you are, okay? And so the way to do that is to understand that um, all of this stuff is just the same thing as storytelling and putting on plays and making jokes and, um, and playing games, okay? Like the best learning experiences, if you really, really think about it, the best learning experiences you've ever had in your life and truly the best experiences you've had have involved having fun. And all of us, I think, are on the same page about the idea that ideas are a lot of fun, right? So when you're writing, don't forget that. We're going to give you a whole just ton of tools for for how you can get playful but the fact is that if you're not endearing yourself to to your reader in that way then you're not getting the most important thing across which is I'm passionate about this I care about this this is fun for me right and because I care about it it should be fun for you that is how things work like if anybody likes the youtuber Rick Beato right anybody anyone what makes him so good what makes him so good is that he's unbelievably passionate about what he does. He's so playful. He's so much fun. He makes jokes. And, he, and you can see him come alive, right? You want that to happen in your writing, and you can make it happen in your writing by using things from the high level to the very low level. High level is things like storytelling, drama, movie references, you know, to talk, about, talk about the things that people want to talk about to get your point across right? And then on the more granular level, you can use puns and rhymes and eloquence and like weird words and like onomatopoeia, right? And then bang, right? I mean, all of that stuff, somehow with business writing, like we got to this point where people were like, oh, that's off limits. We don't, we don't do that, right? Well, that's insane, okay? So this is your permission forever, to get playful with your writing forever, okay? Because if you can do that, this is this is really, I mean, all three of these pillars are 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 important. Um, but ultimately, this is what's going to win you favor with people. It's what's going to make your writing shareable. It's what's going to make people want to read more of what you write. So it's really, really, really important. And for some reason, in business writing, like people don't care about it. So you can give yourself an incredible competitive advantage and also make your life personally more fun as a writer by, um, by doing this. So, totally. Yeah. So basically what we are saying here, just sort of wrap this up before we give you even more about how to actually make your writing pop. In general, a marketable, pe a marketable piece of writing needs to be strong in at least two of these three areas, personal, observational, and playful. But, however, if one of the three pillars is missing, the piece of writing is likely to be two-dimensional. So in order to make your writing truly memorable, you want a strong balance of all three, personal, observational, and playful. And basically what Ellen and I are doing here is we are rebels. We are rebelling against boring ass writing. We are rebelling against academic writing with amazing information in there that nobody reads. There was some paper that came out. It's one of those like, can you believe this? But it like makes perfect sense. Less than 1% of financial white papers are read more than 10 times, which is like, obviously, once you read one of those things, if you can make your writing pop, 
the world is going. <laughs> the world is going to. Elle is laughing. The world is going to be much more magnetic. Ideas are going to share, be shared much more, and your writing is going to be read. It's not like you're running against Usain Bolt here. You are competing against very low competition, and if you can make your writing pop, I'm not kidding. Personal, observational, playful. If you can do, do those two things you are going to skyrocket in the quality of your writing because the fact of the matter is for the vast majority of stuff that people make, no one reads it. No one reads it because it's boring. Okay, Ellen, let's talk about our pop writing legends. Yeah. So basically we went and we were like, okay, you know, the, the, the field test of this framework is whether we can apply it to our favorite people, right? So Taleb, everyone loves Taleb. He is a master of being playful. Anybody who's read any of his stuff, I mean, as far as he's, he's a leading business writer. He is nothing like a, a crappy commercial jingle or like, you know, cheap pop song. He is multidimensional. He's dynamic. He's passionate. You can feel his passion through his writing. And the reason is that he's super playful. Think about Fat Tony. Think about all the different characters and, uh, all the different kinds of fun that he brings into his writing, all the tongue in cheek and all the, all the, you know, all the little digs he, he, he does. I mean, he is, he's one of the most playful business writers ever. Likewise, think about Feynman, right? Everyone loves Feynman. Why is he so good? I mean, he does the exact same thing. He's more playful than, than practically any other physicist, right? And Oliver Sacks, also very, very playful. But he's, he's really, really strong in this, in this personal area. I mean, his writing is so affecting. It's so moving. And it can get people interested in, in neuroscience who otherwise wouldn't be. And, you know, what more can you ask for? And finally, uh, since I majored in economics, we got to throw in Adam Smith, um, the invisible hand, the, the ultimate business writer, right? I mean, the invisible hand of the market, right? The first time I heard that, I don't know about you, but the first time I heard that, I never forgot it. I just never forgot it. Why? Because you're imagining this like magical, weird, disembodied, invisible hand above the planet. That's why, right? That's so playful. It's beautiful imagery. It's captivating. And it's, it's a, it's, it drills that observation. What's really more important is that this makes the writing better. It gets his observation across using this playful methodology and that makes it so much clearer and that makes it easier to understand. So all of, all of this goes to show that basically all of these people would absolutely uh, follow this framework if they, if they knew about it <laughs> and, uh, and, they, and they sort of intuitively do know about it. And this is, not, this is not even remotely like a business and science exclusive thing. These people are all people who bring in, these, these, are, these are artists, right, and, and a comedian who's, who I think is a type of poet, um, they all bring in some really serious observations, like really serious observations. They're very smart people. They bring in really serious observations and uh, really like impactful personal narratives and personal ideas and things that are just super relatable into something that's essentially play, right? Fiction writing, music, comedy, that's the height of play, right? But all three of these people also do the observations really well and they also make things personal and that's what won bob dylan the nobel prize in literature that's what wins these people all of the acclaim that they have the fact that they're able to apply all three of these pillars to something that people conventionally think of as oh that's just for fun just like people conventionally think of business writing as oh that's just for observation no <laughs> all three of these pillars need to be present in everything for people to really remember you and your ideas and who you are and what you stand for absolutely ellen you want to talk about let's go through our toolbox i'll kick it to you for tools for getting personal and then i'll take observation yeah totally so you're not you're not just alone like in the world with just this weird venn diagram in your mind uh the really amazing thing about writing in the 21st century is that you can learn what all of these other writers have done before you. And it's all, it's all kind of like spelled out. This stuff, isn't, this stuff isn't new. So how do you get personal? Well, there's tools that, that are time tested. 
that people use all the time. And the storytelling thing, um, that's huge, right? Learning how to tell a story, not being afraid to tell stories about your life. Um, that's, that's really huge. If you think about, um, like in order, in order to get personal, the most important thing is um, think about talking to just one other person. When you're trying to get a point across to just one other person in conversation, what do you do? You tell a quick story, right? When, when you start writing, that shouldn't disappear, okay? Like that's still totally relevant. Still, that, that allows you to cement that connection and that, that human trust, right? So shared experiences, same idea, right? Bring it back to something that people can all relate to, whether it's public transit or school or having kids or marriage or whatever else. It doesn't really matter, right? But it's a matter of cementing that human connection, getting personal, realizing you're writing for another person, not for Twitter, you know, not for anything else, but for a person. And, you know, ultimately, like the memory bank is really good, like things that we've all experienced. This is why this is almost like a meme. Where were you during September 11th, right? Like in the US, everyone remembers where they were, right? So you can start to form a connection with someone by saying, hey, remember when we all experienced this shared experience together? This stuff is not rocket science. This is like really, really easy. You just have to know it's there for you to use those arrows in your quiver. Yeah, so the big thing, if you wanna think about what bad personal writing is, you could think of things that are entertaining, but that aren't deeper informative. So this is like the intellectual junk food that honestly the internet is totally no known for. People love personal writing, but almost too much. That's when the internet descends into the gossip that just makes exactly Buzzfeed listicles, gossip, tabloids, cheap fiction, all that sort of stuff. That is bad personal writing. But if you can combine the other elements, there's a reason that it's popular. So let's together sort of be anthropologists, figure out what is it that people like, let's borrow from that, and then let's use the, those ideas to actually be observational. So I'm gonna talk about the four things that I do for observational writing. So <laughs> I had a call with Ellen a couple, a couple weeks ago, we were working, and she's like, why are you always in a different place when, when we talk? And one of my core pieces of personal philosophy is to never, ever, ever let living in New York become boring. Like every single day that I leave my apartment, I am a tourist. Like, I treat it no differently from when I go to Shanghai, Singapore, Sydney, Budapest. It is the same thing. I am in New York City. And it's the same thing when I'm in a rural area, I, when I'm in rural Georgia, I went to college in North Carolina. Same thing. When I leave my apartment, I am looking around as if I'm a tourist. And so I have what I call the three B's of creativity. Bed, bath, and bus. Okay, little known thing about me. Yes, this probably makes me sound really lazy. I take a nap almost every single day. Here's why. When I take a nap, 20, 30 minutes, what I'm able to do is like synthesize my morning and basically just let myself dream on it. And I wake up and I'm totally refreshed and what I'm able to do so often is I sort of put my head to sleep. I just like have ideas like, right. You know, like it's super cool. You know, like when you start dreaming, but you're still awake. Does that happen to anybody else? Okay. So it, it, it like just begins to happen to me and I'll just come up with ideas. And so often I will come up with ideas like right after my head goes on the pillow. So you could think of that as bed also with bath. This is basically anything that's for relaxation. So everyone has different ways of relaxing. I don't really just like kick back and relax. For me, bath is much more of like, I'm gonna read something or I'll go for a walk or I'll step into a coffee shop or something like that. And basically what that is, is just letting your mind wander. You know, if you look at stories of people who've come up with creative breakthroughs, they're, you never really come up with a creative breakthrough by saying, I'm going to come up with a creative breakthrough right now. It's always when your brain is sort of just like 
floundering and you're in a much more relaxed state that you can come up with those. But then also this gets back to where I was at the beginning bus actually being on the go. Like for me, I'm probably in the top 1% of people who are just moving around. Like I am just bopping around New York all the time. I'm in and out of my apartment, even in my apartment, I like work in different places. Um, I was in Manhattan today, going, came back home to Brooklyn now, back to Manhattan tonight, going up to Columbia tonight for philosophy tutoring, then coming back. Like, I'm just all over the place. And it's just because I come up with ideas when I'm on the move. So bed, bath, and bus. That's the first thing that really helps me with observation. Also, capturing your ideas. I was, <laughs> this guy made fun of me for this. So I was at a concert on, on, on Saturday night and we were talking about this idea, and I literally, during the show, took out my notebook and wrote down this idea, and this guy was like, why are you writing down this stuff? And it's because, I'm telling you, just listen to me, it's true. You are already having the good ideas that you need to start writing. The problem is, the vast majority of you don't actually capture that stuff, and so, woo, your ideas just wither away to the ephemerality of time. Write down your good ideas when you have them. And how do you know if you have a good idea? Well, you look for surprises. So what is a surprise? And this, my friends, is when you need to trust your intuition. Whenever you feel your heart rate racing fast, your hands kind of sweating a little, your head kind of racing back, anything like you have to be in kind of that meditative state of paying attention to your own consciousness, your own awareness. But when you feel some kind of movement in your inner emotions or anything like that, pay attention to it. If you walk into a place and all of a sudden you feel something beautiful, if something feels difficult or tense, like what's great about being a writer, this is like the ultimate gift of being a writer. Your worst experiences, your best experiences, your confusing experiences, your funny experiences, Thanksgiving with the in-laws, and your best romantic evenings, they are all things for you to write about. The entire world is a potential future sentence. So pay attention to the surprises and the anomalies in the world. And once again, the best way to do that is to make the world unfamiliar. If you can make the world unfamiliar, nothing becomes habitual. And I'm telling you, there is, no two moments are ever the same. No two conversations are ever the same. No two sunsets are ever the same. And no two cups of coffee stay the same. Observe, 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 and do not let the world be something that you take for granted. Yeah, I mean, totally spot on. Listen to him because he he really he really lives he really lives that. Um, so yeah, so playful. Um, Tools for being playful abound. Um, these are just kind of really high level sort of ideas of, of just the directions you can go with playfulness. There are so many ways to be playful. So uh, think about the word play, right? There's putting on a play like a theater. So that embodies all of this stuff like making up characters, Fat Tony, all that stuff, personifying things. Um, just bringing in, bringing in drama, kind of, kind of of any kind, is 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 theatrical and and is playful in that sense. So you can also play mind games with your reader. I, re I really like doing this. Like, you know, uh, engage their imagination and think. You know, imagine that tomorrow. Um, you know, imagine that tomorrow you found out that ten years from now you're going to get twenty million dollars. Right? What do you do in the next ten years? right? Whatever it is, just play, play a game with, play a game with your audience. Um, that's, that's a great way to get playful and bring them into it. Being lighthearted in general um, is, is a good practice. And I find that, like, I, I kind of struggle with this. Like, I, I come from an Eastern European background. So, like, I tend to be sort of like Dostoevsky, you know, like, 
<laughs> not 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 quite like him, but I tend to. Emma loves little, to give herself very be, high praise. Everybody, please. I tend to be a little. <laughs> no, Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky was like miserable, right? So, he was um, miserable. So I tend. So I tend. Miserable to be, genius. Tend to get very gloomy, right? I'm a I'm a sick man. I am a spiteful man, right? I tend to get very gloomy, and I think I think a lot of people have that tendency when they get to writing alone at night because we're all like so many of us are nocturnal, right? You know, you gotta you gotta get yourself out of that. Um, and the best way to to do that in my experience is to talk through your ideas with someone, bounce them, bounce them around with someone. Um, but in general, uh, you know, think about like what people actually want to talk about. Think about sports, think about pop culture, think about movies and pictures and multimedia and all that stuff. There's so many ways to, um, to not just kind of have a one track mind when it comes to writing and to bring in bring in a, a more dynamic and, and a more, um, just a more fun kind of style and bringing in all these different materials, right? And then of course, playing with language, right? Uh, just in general, using fun words, a really, really great kind of thing to remember is that anytime you bring, anytime you invoke um, one of the five senses, you're kind of tickling that region of the person's brain, right? So if I tell you like, Imagine biting into a slice of a lime, right? All of a sudden, like everybody kind of knows what I'm talking about and there's this idea of taste that's coming into play. So bringing in sensory language um, is, is a really, really great way to get playful and kind of liven up your writing. On a more granular level, you can use alliteration, you can use repetition. Um, look at, if you wanna learn how to, how to play with language and what, what makes sense, like a good way is to look at great, great speeches. Look at Martin Luther King and, and actually read his speeches. I mean, he was really, really, really good at this. He was really good at this. So read the speeches, look at what he's doing. Look at how many times he'll repeat phrases. That's what makes, that's what makes his verbiage so iconic. And that's true of great speakers in general, whether it's JFK or Reagan or whoever else you like. Um, you can you can read that and 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 think about just the music of the writing. Let yourself do that. Business writing uh, doesn't have to read, um, you know, in this kind of dry way. Quite the contrary, it should it should read in a way that that's lively and that that brings in your senses and and that brings in play. So. That's kind of a, an overview of how you can get playful. Um, there's, there's so many things that you can do, but, but I encourage you to tell stories and use fun language and, and use mind games and do the things that are fun in conversation. Like do the things that you would do if you're sitting at a bar and having a beer with someone, right? Like don't, you know, don't, don't button yourself up too much, basically. Let yourself be playful. Your kid inside is still there, and so is your readers. Totally. So just to refresh here, these are the pillars of pop writing. So you want it to be personal, observational, and playful. So for personal, look at people. Bring out the soul in them. And you could think of just like a text message. Text messages are personal and you can apply some of that ethos into your own writing. With observational writing, look, that's a fresh look at the world. You are seeing things, remember, both as a first timer and a last timer, because that is what makes the world meaningful and important. It's what makes this moment singular, and each moment is one of a kind. And so bring out your glasses, you know, it was really funny. I did a, a trip through, through Europe one time and we had these things called blue blockers and basically they block out all the color blue in the world and you just see the world differently. There's things that you would otherwise see that you don't see here and you could think of like what are all the different lenses that I can put over the world because that's going to help you be observational and think of that like writing notes like Charles Darwin and then also with playfulness make you are writing fun and enjoyable. Bring out the kid in your reader. And even in business writing, this works. It's one of those like taboo things that everyone wants the writing to be more playful, but nobody does it. And playful writing is just more fun. And if people actually enjoy listening to what you're saying, they're not going to tune out. So what now? Ellen, you want to talk about, actually, why don't I do this? And you'll do, you'll analyze the paragraph. So here's the great thing about pop writing. What do you need to do? 
Honestly, nothing. All you got to do is listen to these ideas and just start reading with this pop writing lens. You don't need to go fill out some worksheet. You don't need to do anything right now. Just have this as a lens that you're looking at the world with. And you don't need to start writing right now, but just when you start reading, and we're going to teach you how to do this in just a couple minutes, when you start reading, pay attention to things that are personal, observational, and playful, and just make a mental note. And maybe write down playful sentences, write down observational ones, write down personal ones, and look out. You don't need to look within. And what you'll see is that your writing actually starts to improve naturally. And then finally start exploring. Look at the people, look at the writers that you already love, find their strengths, just like with Oliver Sacks, just like with Nassim Taleb, with Dave Chappelle. Look at the things that they're doing well, see how they're doing that, and actually borrow their tactics. It's amazing for something so simple it's going to be a transformative shift for you. And the shift won't happen right away at the snap of a finger, but you're going to see over time, you're actually going to internalize these things. And what you want to do exactly is you want to, even as a consumer, consume as a producer. And this is why you need to both consume and produce. If you are only spending time consuming, what ends up happening is you don't actually improve your craft. Well, you'll realize if you ever start drawing, going to an art museum is so much more fruitful. Likewise, when you start writing, actually reading becomes this transformative experience for you because the process of consumption actually aids in the process of production. So Ellen's going to go over two examples. First, from the Constellations of Philosophy by Alan de Botton. Right. So um, he, this guy like made philosophy fun. Um, and, and what I like about this example is it's, it's a little bit meta. So he's talking about why Seneca was so great. And he's, um, so we color coded this a little bit. So you can, you can use your intuition and just slow down a little bit. And as you read, you'll see, hey, what's the observation he's making? Because it's going to be there. There's going to be an observation. The observation he's making is Seneca believed in a different picture of the mind, right? Most of the philosophers at the time that we don't remember their names, right? Uh, they were doing what business writing still is now. They were using data all the time and not having any fun and being dry, okay? Seneca believed in a different picture of the mind. Now, um, uh, de Botton, I don't even know how to pronounce his name. Um, is that it? So, so the playfulness component, he brings that in to actually evoke Seneca's, um, to actually evoke Seneca's style. He said, arguments are like eels. How playful is that? Arguments are like eels. However logical they can slip for, from your mind's grasp unless fixed there by imagery or style. So he's getting his point across in a super playful way. And then the personal component brings in, we need metaphors to derive a sense of what cannot be seen or touched or else we will forget. So that's a resonant and relatable statement. And I, I also put exposure to accident here, highlighted this as a, as a personal thing because he's bringing in, you know, these, these human vulnerabilities that we, that we all have. And that's a personal thing too. Um, so there's a lot of different ways. It's kind of, this model is meant to be intuitive and it's meant to sort of lock in and, and allow you to see things this way and, and start to understand rather than having too much of sort of a binary, oh, this, you know, this is playful, this is not the whole thing. But you can see, you'll start to see, okay, now he's bringing in his observation. Now he's bringing in a playful way to characterize and evoke and illustrate that, right? And then finally, he's kind of backing that up with like, hey, no, like you, you've forgotten things before, right? So let me remind you of the fact that that you forget things and let me bring that into the personal thing so that's that's this example and then the other one um here i got this one so this is yeah, with yeah, rory it. sutherland and rory sutherland is awesome if you don't know rory sutherland this is going to be a wave that you serve for a while the man so i had the pleasure of interviewing rory sutherland and 
it was it was really fun. He's one of my favorite writers, but also such a good example of writing that pops. So here he says, observationally, in the real world, social context is absolutely critical. For instance, as the anthropologist Pierre Bourdieu observes, gift giving is viewed as a good thing in most human societies. But observational again, but it only takes a very small change in context to make a gift an insult rather than a blessing. Here's personal, because now he's talking about himself, right? And you sort of think about him. Returning a present to the person who has given it to you, for example, is one of the rudest things you can do. He's probably thought about it, right? Something like that. And so he, he, he's getting personal there. And then now he's getting playful. This is the punchline at the end. Similarly, offering people money when they do something you like makes perfect sense according to economic theory and is called an incentive. But this does not mean you should try to pay your spouse for sex. And it is in one paragraph, boom, 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 personal, observational, and playful. And so that's what this looks like with both Botan and Sutherland. So look, that is what we have for you today. And once again, this is the kind of thing that you should, the kind of lens that you should have as you continue to read. And if this is the kind of conversation that you just want to have nonstop for five weeks in a row, Rite of Passage starts on Wednesday. We would love to have you. I don't know if there is a more, I don't think there is. If there honestly is, tell me, I will join it. If there's a more digitally savvy, intellectually curious, writing or idea obsessed community in the world than Rite of Passage, we're gonna to get together for five weeks and we've made some awesome changes. This is an all new Rite of Passage unlike anything we've had. So we have a whole new community center, which is a forum where we're gonna be hosting the course on. We have this thing called Initiation Week where basically Rite of Passage isn't just about writing, it's about building amazing friendships from around the world. So we have live events the first five days. You're gonna get feedback from all these different people using this Cribs model that we've developed in Rite of Passage for how to give feedback in a structured way. And just imagine, you're with all of these people who have these same kind of frameworks as you. Uh, we're adding alumni mentorships, a student directory. We have this live writing workshop where on Saturdays now, we call it CrossFit for Writing. We get together on Saturdays and we all go start to finish on an article, boom, 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 boom. And it's made possible because in the very first week, you end up setting up this note-taking system so that you can capture all your observations, the best of what you read, and save them in your smartphone so that you can always access them. That is what allows you to be prolific. And finally, we're adding this pop writing idea to the course. So everyone in Rite of Passage is going to know about pop writing. And it's just, it's a beautiful writing world. Uh, Ellen, you want to talk a little bit about how we can get in touch with you? Yeah, so please, um, I invite you to email. I keep my web presence kind of lightweight, a little bit under the radar. Um, but I invite anybody to get in touch with me at ellen at ellenrhymes.com. And uh, I really, really love to work with people on their writing one-on-one. -on -one. So if you feel like you're looking for someone to show you these are your strengths. These are your weaknesses. This is what you can do to amplify your strengths. If you're looking for someone who can give you positive and useful feedback, um, who, who is experienced, uh, and if, if you're kind of looking to level up your writing in a, in a really personal kind of one-on-one -on -one way, working with someone who's really a specialist in writing above else, uh, above everything else, then we might be a good fit. So I would love to hear from any of you. And I also want to give like a little shout out to the people who showed up on my invitation. Uh, as you all know, this is like my first like public talk online. And it's been so, so wonderful for David to give me this opportunity. And I'm so glad those of you who came out did. Um, thank you for supporting. Round of applause for Ellen, everybody. Well, to all of you, thank you very much. Loved meeting all of you, and I hope to see you in Rite of Passage, if not on the internet. Rite of Passage starts on Wednesday, and uh, this is what we do for five weeks. We talk, and you work really hard, and you 
you really become a writer. Thanks, everybody. I will see you soon. Cheers.